Good evening, my name is Paula Jackman. I am an MA student at the EBCCA, and today I am presenting for my theories of learning in the arts class on the art of public speaking. But before we get into a class, a real one-on-one -on -one class for you to watch and for you to walk away with some great information, I'm going to give you a little theory, but theory doesn't have to be boring, so stick with me. What is learning? Learning is an experience which produces relatively permanent change in behavior or potential behavior. Learning could be thought of as a process by which behavior changes as a result of an experience. So basically, we learn by doing, and that's according to Maples and Webster. What is a learning theory? It's a set of principles that explain how best a student can acquire and retain and recall new information. So remember those three things, acquire, retain, and recall. But don't regurgitate. Let's move on. Let's talk about constructivism. Now there are three learning theories, behaviorism, constructivism, and thirdly, cognitivism. I'm going to talk to you today about constructivism because that is my absolute favorite. What is constructivism? Well, constructivism is a learning theory that practically states learning is actively constructed in the mind of the learners out of their experiences in the world. So each learner generates his own rules or her and mental models through experiencing things and reflecting on those experiences. So in constructivism, learners start with a complex problem and work it out to discover the basic skills required to solve the problem. And in solving the problem, you learn whatever it is that you're attempting to acquire, retain, and recall. This method of learning then involves cooperative learning, experimentation, open-ended problems, and real-life scenarios. So what is the role of a teacher in constructivism? A teacher would then facilitate the entire problem-solving process and also motivate their students to help them be reassured that they can find the solution to the problem. They also help students by encouraging them to explore, collaborate, invent, and of course, experiment. So what exactly do constructivists believe? Well, they believe learning is active. You're learning by doing. You have to get out into the world and get stuff happening in order for processes to stick in the mind. They believe it is shaped by personal experiences as well, not just experiences created in the classroom. So who you come to the classroom as, what background you bring to the environment will help you to process information in a different way. And they believe it's also impacted by cultural factors. So I might learn in a very different way to my colleague in Montserrat or St. Lucia or even one of the metropoles. So today's lesson. Today's lesson is embodying constructivist principles and therefore it will involve hands-on learning, instructions to guide, it involves problem solving, and finally it involves discovery learning. Instead of providing exact answers to my student, they'll be given the tools to figure out the answer themselves. So let's talk a little bit about my student before we get into the class. My student is Ariane Lovell. She's age 18. She's in the formal operational stage according to Piaget's four stages of cognitive development. According to Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, she is mostly visual, spatial, and musical. This is evidenced by her fashion sense, her ability to draw, and her ability to sing. Time for class. It's time to get into class. Once again, I am Paula Jackman and this is my student, Ariane Lovell. She's 18 years old, visual, spatial and musical. And today, using the theory of constructivism as a guide and a basis for class, we are going to be looking at the art of public speaking. Of course, it's always best to start with learning objectives. Our learning objectives today are three in number, Ariane. 
One, we're learning about the harmonious blending of speech and delivery. Two, we're learning tools for avoiding hiccups of speech. Have you ever heard about hiccups of speech? No, I haven't. Okay. And finally, we're going to master getting ready to face the public. And when I say master, I use that loosely given that it's a very short class today and we're compressing a lot of information that is truly dead into a short presentation. So starting first with our first learning objective, the harmonious blending of speech and delivery. And because we're using the theory of constructivism as a guide, we're going to start with the problem. So Ariane is going to read a paragraph from this textbook that I'm actually using as a guide for today. And it's called Teach Yourself Public Speaking by Dennis Castle and John Wade. Just this paragraph from few to no. Few entering speakers are ever mindful of speech presentation. That is the harmonious blending of speech and delivery. Presentation, in other words, meaning your text exactly the right means giving your text exactly the right treatment, both in timing and demeanor. As you will see in the next chapter on drafting speeches, the subject must be permanent, pertinent to the occasion, and obviously you would not prepare an entirely irrelevant script, but even the most appropriate wording can cause nervousness in the first time speeches, be delivered in entirely the wrong manner, being off key, like this is understandable, when, when tensed up by the occasion and the strain of remembering your lines. But no, for a warrant, we can obviate. Obviate. Obviate this fault here and now. Thank you. Okay, so let's critique how that went. First of all, I gave it to her, and she had never seen it before. In the art of public speaking, nothing you are saying to the public you should have never seen before. Because as you're figuring it out, just like she was with the word obviate, then you are now trying to get to learn the material instead of being a master of the material and delivering it to your audience. So never find yourself before your audience now figuring it out. Or you will experience the challenge that Ariane had. But I didn't give you the material before, so that's not your fault. But let's talk more about pace, rhythm, and timing. One of the reasons that Ariane wouldn't have the right pace, rhythm, or timing with this piece is she doesn't know the material. And that is why you need to have it beforehand if someone is giving it to you or prepare it beforehand if you're working on it yourself so that you can know where you need to make pauses for emphasis, where you need to repeat, where you need to pause and look at your audience, and several other techniques. Nerves tend to make us speak very quickly. And others of us, nerves make us speak very slowly. Ariane's pace, to my mind, is actually quite fitting for the material. A slow delivery can also be quite boring. Speak slightly slowly than, slower than you would in normal conversation and give the words a shade more projection and volume. So as I'm speaking to camera right now, it's not the way that I would if the camera isn't there. I would probably be speaking a lot faster and I wouldn't be pausing for emphasis. Am I right? So ask yourself, how do you speak naturally? If you draw and speak slowly and tend to be at this pace, then be crisp and pick the pace up. If you tend to race and speak very quickly like this, as several of us do in the Caribbean, then you want to take a moment to pause, take more breaths in between sentences and cultivate the power of the pause. Remember to check yourself. Mirror work is a great help. And of course, tape yourself. 
No one likes to tape themselves and hear themselves over again. But taping yourself and watching it can show you lots of things to help you as you go forward. So we've looked at pace, rhythm, and timing. Do you better understand it? You think? <laughs> Let's have a look now at learning tools for avoiding hiccups of speech. So learning what you learned just now, it's still something that she's seeing for the first time about rhythm and pace and timing. You could probably read just three sentences. Yeah. Really is even a good speech entirely devoid of the ums and of everyday indecision. These hiccups of speech are caused when the brain and the book cries suddenly slip a cog and become temporarily out of tune with each other. For a few seconds, they misfire the brain. They misfire the brain failing to register sense to the tongue and smooth synchronization. Synchronization yeah, is momentarily lost. Okay, that's enough. Do you remember what you read? <laughs> I read it, but I didn't read it to memory. Okay. Do you remember anything we've learned in the lesson so far? That timing, speed, timing and speed are very important when you're giving a speech. You don't talk too fast. So, yeah, don't talk too fast. Don't talk too slow to lose the interest of listeners and don't draw out the speech. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to learn about hiccup words. Ariane actually doesn't have many. That exercise wasn't about rhythm and pace. It was about her talking to me and me getting a sense of what hiccup words she actually uses. I have heard her use um before, but she didn't actually use it just now. And when she was finished and trying to think of what more to say, she said, uh, yeah, you recall saying that? Those are examples of hiccup words. So things like, um, some people say, well, basically, and people say, uh, you know, all those things are words that you are using while your brain tries to catch up to your mouth. The key is to shut your mouth, actually, and give your brain time to catch up. And one of the most powerful things that you can use, the most powerful tools you can ever utilize, is the power of the pause. You'll find that sometimes it's better to have dead air than crutch words because people stop listening to what you say. So examples, as I said before, are um, ah, uh, er, basically, and ah. Uh. I remember doing mass communication at Barbados Community College, and my tutor at the time had a bowl. And we all had to put a dollar in it every time we used a crutch word. So I was cheap. So I got out of the habit of using crutch words quickly. But for some people, it's not going to happen overnight. Remember these three things to help you get over the use of hiccup words. One, pause to give time for your brain to catch up to your voice. I even did it just now. Did you catch it? Two, Silence is more effective than meaningless fillers. So when she was done, she could have simply stopped. But nervousness and a bit of being unsure of self with the camera there especially, she said, uh, yeah. You're kind of looking for reassurance from the person in front of you that they're listening, they're grasping what you're saying. And I completely understand. But if you're doing a bit of public speaking, you're going to need to utilize the power of the pause to make sure you aren't distracting people with what I also call crutch words, but they're called hiccup words. Three, if lost for words are distracted by calamity, again, pause. Like I will while this dog continues to bark. Let's look now at the final learning objective, mastering getting ready to face 
the public. One of the keys is to first face yourself. Have you ever talked to yourself in the mirror? Well, one of, a, one of the great tips is to watch yourself in a mirror when you are rehearsing a speech. Not with the notes in your hand, but when you have more or less committed to memory what you wish to say. Perhaps you are the type to gulp, swallow loudly, appearing to swallow hard every sentence. Do you hand like peck forward as you utter? Do you speak like this? Not you, not us. <laughs> Are you, when imparting what you feel to be a particularly apt phrase, liable to emphasize it by tilting your head sideways? If so, this can make you un appear unwittingly winsome, coy, or arch. Do your hands thresh the air as you try and, and engender extra impact? And that's me. I definitely speak with my hands a lot. Do you shrug or hunch your shoulders continually? Do your hands get in the way when you are on your feet? We see such sufferers being interviewed on television. They wriggle in the chair, rock their heads, clench and unclench hands, clasp knees, straighten ties, pat hair, or fiddle with medallions, or women might fiddle with necklaces. Perhaps if they are already famous in other fields, their mannerisms can be forgiven. Being familiar figures already, exaggerated gestures will not distract the audience from what they are saying. But for a non-celebrity, <laughs> any restless movement is a great handicap. Being strangers to the audience, they will be viewed by first appearance values so that the essence of what they have to say is lost if magnified gestures attract the eyes of the listeners and not their ears. After all, the reason you are being interviewed is for what you have to say. Good speakers remain as still as possible. They use movements so sparingly that when they do make a gesture, it really does usually emphasize a particular point. Certainly, they turn their heads evenly to encompass the audience to the left and to the right of the microphone, but it's never a jerked, intense movement. Nor do they fix their eyes on the wall opposite and remain like stone statues looking ahead all of the time. They may well use their eyes cleverly to underline phrases, raising or lowering them as the situation under discussion warrants, even to narrowing them for simulated self-bewilderment or widening, widening them for mock surprise. And these are just a few of the tips. But one of the key things to remember is have a look in the mirror and face yourself and see what you do. Are you just simulating a lot, use of the hands? Are you very tense? Right now you're sitting forward instead of sitting back in a relaxed way that tells your audience that you are comfortable. Her hands are also clasped. She doesn't like the camera. <laughs> Remain as still as possible without looking uncomfortable. I use movement sparingly. <laughs> use gestures for emphasis. Or emphasis. Turn your head slightly so no jerk intense movement. Don't be a statue. Use your eyes to convey the message. Don't fidget with your glasses. They're either on or off. Some people tend to make points like this. Like my guy from CSI. But it works for him, but it can't work for us. It's very distracting to someone who's watching these videos. A relaxed stance is important. Keep your legs slightly apart, weight forward on the balls of your feet. If you put your weight on the calves of your feet, your feet will actually get tired a lot more quickly. But we're sitting, so we don't have to worry about that. Do not hold or fondle the microphone if you have one, or a microphone stand. You may actually be causing distortions. Don't get too close to the microphone. Three to four inches away is a good measurement. And hold notes at the chest if you have to do any reading. Hands clasped or knuckles on the palm is one of the best ways to go ahead and make your speech. Remember jewelry as well. Noisy jewelry can also be distracting. But the key thing is to practice, practice, practice. 
So the next time we do this, if I can ever get her back in front of the camera, she'll be much more poised now that she's learned about the harmonious blending of speech and delivery. She's learned tools for avoiding hiccups of speech, and she has learned about mastering getting ready to face the public. So do you feel ready? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching this short video on the art of public speaking by myself, Paula Jackman, and my student for the day, Ariane Lovell. Have a nice day.